Welcome to the Newfangled Workshop Podcast. Before we get into it, let's hear a little disclaimer. The views expressed here are those of the participants and do not reflect the views of the United States Military Academy, the United States Army, or the Department of Defense. And Led's looking very concerned. Welcome to the good evening, uh, Newfangled guys. Workshop. <laughs> good evening. Uh, tonight's uh, podcast is brought to you by Matt, Led, and Stephen. Yes. <laughs> They're going to be talking about things, very interesting things. And so Stephen's obviously springing a new background on us. Yes. Yeah. Those are the, what are those? Those are rear end springs from Max Mustang. But uh, the ones we took out because they're lowering springs. As I, as in... I get older, I want to get out of my chair. I think rear end springs. That's what I think. <laughs> I know, right? Maybe a self lifting chair. <laughs> yeah. Now, Stephen, is it is it auto cross, auto rally? These are different things, right? The, which rally is cross is? Yeah, he needs like springs to lift the rear end actually for, for more ground clearance because he's doing um, uh, sort of an off road like uh, rally cross. Yeah. That's right. Excellent. That's right. But um, uh, tonight's format was going to be to share something interesting from the internet, right? Um, an interesting project that you've run into. Uh, does anybody want to uh, volunteer to start? Or um, uh, I could kick it off if you'd like. Um, uh, I, I'd be happy to jump in with my my first with my project. Well, uh, we're all shy go, people, so like so hard to I get, know, yes, right? you get a bunch of inter, inter, introverts together, and none of Matthew us. Matthew has talked. volunteered to talk first. What? Okay, <laughs> that's just crazy. Uh, I'll go ahead and share my whole screen here. And uh, with the sharing of the screen, this is the YouTube video that I find interesting. Um, tonight's thing is uh, brought to you by uh, Magnet Magnetic Games. And it's a gentleman who put together this board, uh, a series of boards with magnets that break this brick. So the very beginning of the video, I, I don't you know, we need to capture the sound, but he lets go of the ball. And it breaks the brick. It's all very exciting. And that if we go back just one frame there, if I can go back, it's, this is the thing I find super interesting is he put together a series of magnets that get progressively stronger and the ball itself is magnetic as well. He releases it down here. It rolls slowly. It gets caught up in the magnetic fields of these blocks uh, and then smashes the brick and breaks the brick. And this is what a three and a half minute video that shows you how he did it. There's some wedges in the background here that I found really interesting. The, he's got a sheet of metal. He's putting the magnets on the sheets of metal to hold them in place. Um, and he placed them very carefully using the wedges. So he would put it on top of the piece of wood and then slide it down to get it into place. Um, and then let's go of it, and the magnet grabs very strongly to the piece of metal that is his uh, floor there. The track, the piece of wood in the middle, does have a groove in it, so the ball rolls straight, right? So the ball stays in the track as it rolls. Um, and what he did is he spaced them out to the point that right as he gets to the end of the one magnetic field and it would attempt to come back, it reaches the next magnet that grabs it and continues to accelerate it. Um, and then the final magnet, it always stops in the middle here. It hit the brick because it had enough momentum to go past the magnetic field, but then the magnetic field is strong enough to pull it back and hold it. Um, and one of the things you see him struggle with in the video is to release this ball after he rolls it um, is super interesting to me. He has to really uh, work very hard, have good upper body strength in order to get that magnet out of the track and fire it a second time. Um, and so to me, I was just, this came up in my algorithm the other day and I thought it was exceptionally interesting that uh, he was using the magnets to accelerate the ball down the track. And I don't know, this has a ton of practical, uh, you know, 
outcome other than I thought this was fun science that was dramatic or, you know, the drama of science. Uh, this would go well in a physics class, I thought, and we could talk about, like, the momentum and the energy moving forward, um, but enough to break the brick. And it's also interesting, he had to go through a number of iterations. He tried it with the first four, and I'm going to hope that color is orange. That orange yeah, set- well, I mean, you have to have the orange one. That's an important part of the physics. Uh, well, so the orange ones, that was going to be the end, and it turned out he wasn't moving the ball fast enough, so he got the, the super mega magnets. Uh, this is also a significant amount of dollars invested in these super strong magnets. Um, it was fun to see him unpackage the magnets because they come in this giant padded box for the little magnet in the middle so that during shipping, like you're not putting this super strong magnet on top of the next box that happens to have, you know, Led's new laptop. That so my kitchen aid, my kitchen aid doesn't come stuck to the other guy's package. Correct. And you don't want the guy in the back of the UPS van, like struggling to get the boxes detached from each other. Well, the magnet, the magnet could probably break out of the box too. Uh, right. So ra- so the packaging on the magnets was very uh, uh, intense, <laughs> I thought, um, and just super fun. So to me, Stephen said, what's a project you've seen somebody work on on the Internet recently? This was my uh, attempt at I thought this was really cool. I was fascinated. I must have watched this video five or six or seven times now. How fast was the ball going when it struck the brick? Uh, we can jump, yeah, we got, to, we can jump, yeah, to, the jump to that part, Matt. Yeah, we'll, we'll jump and to- so Matt, you're saying you don't know if there's a practical application. I'm scratching my head and like, if I were in the Navy and I wanted to shoot down an airplane from my aircraft carrier, <laughs> right? And I needed something to propel something really fast. I would call it a rail gun. Yeah, <laughs> right? sure. And so here we go. They would work what this, is. this is a rail gun, right? This, that's so he, put, so he, puts, the mag- he puts the right? magnetic ball in his spray. Oh, God. Right. So here it is. He's going to fire it at the, the brick now. And it's, oh, he knocked the brick over. That wasn't good enough. So now we have to pull the ball back and like break it out of each one of the magnets because it's that like, we got to have the glove on so we don't hurt ourselves. Uh, and now we fire it again better. We've moved the brick closer to the center of where the magnetic force is. So it hasn't started to pull itself back yet. Uh, but that's him. So it's a rail gun. Sure. I, that sounds great. This sounds like how in Battlestar Galactica, this seems to me how they would have launched the Vipers out of the little. Uh, wings on Battlestar Galactica. <laughs> right. Matthew, let's be clear. Are we talking the modern Battlestar Galactica or the one from the 80s? Okay, so they're both very uh, personal to me. I like both of those series very, very much. I do like the modern one because they went further with the story. I It's a very it's a shame to me that Battlestar Galactica 1979 got canceled uh, so early. <laughs> right. Like, I, I wish they would have had more time with Lauren Green to, to tell and Robert Hatch to tell those stories. Well, and what I was wondering about was the robot dog. Right? Yes. Like, what's yes. up with the robot dog? And yes. who built the robot dog? Was that a maker project? It right, could have been. Right. And, they were like boxy and whatever it was. That was spectacular. So um, he also used this film that I'm not familiar with. And again, one of the reasons I enjoy this podcast is that you guys educate me on a lot of stuff. Um, he's got this film that seems to be showing off where the magnetic fields are. Uh, that, that, <laughs> that, that, that's called a flim flam film. Uh... And, and, and so he's like dragging the film across and you can see where the film, where, where the things are. And I thought that was an interesting. What the heck pro- is that? Right. I didn't know either. And I thought no, it was kind of know. right. Like, well, right. What? So you Googled it for us and found out what it is. No, I didn't. Oh, come on. This is a podcast. You're supposed to be educating no. our listeners, and I'm no. feeling like dumber now because I, I'm I also what that film is. I also don't understand why he labeled them S and N, right? Like one's oh, south and one's on north. Or... Yeah, exactly. The polarity. It's the polarity. Well, so wouldn't the polarity like the have... like the magnet, like a compass on a magnet? Yeah. Right? It's got a north side on the ma- on the Oh, here comes one of our avid on listeners. Our avid listener has brought us something called CMS Magnetics 12 by 12 green. It is, I'm clicking. Uh, the producer is talking in my ear right now. Uh, oh, here we go. oh, they're telling me. That magnetic they're... flux viewing film <laughs> for revealing hidden magnetic field patterns in permanent magnets for science projects, research, and STEM education in magnetism. <laughs> So Vance, thought- over to you in the studio. <laughs> you can buy them in 12 by 12, 4 by 6, 6 by 6, or 4 and a half by 6 and a half. They have green film, olive film, green and olive, olive guard film. Uh, there's another section in the video where he actually puts a second non-magnetic, non-metal ball, 
right at the center of the strongest magnet. And as the ball comes forward, it strikes the next piece that that fires out of the rail gun. Right. So instead of breaking a brick, he fires another projectile that the big ball hits and then the second one moves along. But, but let's be clear, this is not a Rube Goldberg machine. It's something else. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> So to me, it was just fun science. So Stephen, what was interesting to me, this was dramatic science that I thought a high school physics class could spend a week, you know, doing a module on this three minute video. Oh, okay, um, let me ask a question, though. If you were in high school and you had this setup, would you try firing the ball at something besides a brick? Of course I would. That's the whole idea. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. When I what is so hopefully when I show off, this is how you put Mentos into <laughs> two liter bottles of Diet Coke. My hope is I'm my dream for that experiment is they'll go home and experiment. And you find out if you grind up the Mentos and make Mentos power powder, it works better because there's more surface area to hit the Diet Coke. Right. So not just more Mentos, but grinding the Mentos up actually gives you a better reaction as well. And then uh, modifying the two liter bottle. Don't leak, just take the cap off and drop the Mentos in. Put the cap back on and drill a one eighth inch hole in the bottle cap so that the nozzle is much, much smaller, forcing the pressure to make it go much, much higher. Um, and so if you drill a one eighth inch hole in your bottle cap, you can get the Mentos thing to be much more dramatic. Well, I, and and also, like, the whole Mentos experiment really is just about how frightening Diet Coke actually is and why <laughs> you should not drink it. Like, it's full of – it's full of alien energy, like some sort of – like some sort of lurking um, – lurking – There's a chemical reaction going on there, and you have to wonder what you do. Um, I think we can wander into this topic. I watched a video the other day explaining the correct way to pour a beer. And when you pour a beer correctly, you want a great deal of head on the beer that then goes down and you pour more beer in so that you're not taking in all of that air that's generated, right? If you don't release the head as you're pouring the beer and you do a very clean pour with no head on it, all of that carbon dioxide stuff that makes the bubbles ends up in your stomach, right? But, but it's also part of the flavor profile. People you, like the flavor profile and the texture of the bubbles. Oh, so this is called the the scientists call this the mouth feel of right. the of the Dorito. Mm -hmm. right? I don't so think scientists call it that. I think just like like internet um, internet people <laughs> who think about these things. Like I, I don't know, scientists so, don't think do, about these things. Do they? Well, that's <laughs> why that's why nitrogen poor beer and wine is different than carbon uh, carbon dioxide uh, you know poured beer and wine, right? Because yeah. the nitrogen bubbles are smaller and gives a different taste. I'm supposed to get my big yellow can from England, right? And there's a little pill in the bottom that has the nitrogen. So when I open it, it mm -hmm. actually nitrates, right? I forget the name of it. Is that a Guinness beer that does that, right? Uh, there's several there's, kinds. Uh, variety. There's a variety of them, too. Nice. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. So I, anyway, I don't know, man. Sweet. So that's my project. I think that project went fairly well. Yeah. Thank nice. you for sharing, Matthew. It was kind of cool. Yeah. Yeah. And lots of side comments, it. right? So uh, it worked out great. Uh, what, one thing I learned about magnetics is that if you heat a magnet, it can lose its um, magnetic capabilities, right? And so like powder coating was a fun thing at the lab lately. So we would heat something, uh, bake it in an oven, but you can't really powder coat oven uh, mag magnets because they'll lose a lot of their properties when you powder coat them. Hmm. And you so you have to it. coat them with epoxies instead or something like that. Yeah, right. It's an enamel epoxy. Yeah. Okay. Acrylic. Have either of you played with something called the mag switch, the on off magnets? Uh, the woodworker. Yeah, you know, I mean, we have them on the, we have them on the, like the dial indicator for the lathe or the, the mill. Yeah. yeah that's right? where I've seen them. And uh, when, we, when we go to instrument like a bridge, so if you go out on a, on a bridge project and you're trying to look for deflections of the bridge, then you, you buy these things that have a switching magnet. Slap it on there and, and you, you put it on yeah. there and then you switch it on and then you can do the dial gauge. I'm going to, I'm going to pull up for you. Uh, we use them for feather boards, um, uh, on, uh, uh, woodworking. So you put it on your table saw and the feather board is, uh, the knob at the top turns the magnet on and off again. So let me share my screen here with you so you can see what I'm talking about. Share screen, share. And these are the mag switch feather boards. That oh, nice. 
right? And those two knobs turn the big, strong magnet on and off. So I can position the mag switch wherever I with the featherboard wherever I need it on the uh, table saw to act as my featherboard to hold it against the fence. And I can turn the magnets on and off. And they're very strong, rare earth magnets. So when I turn them on, like you can't move it as you push the wood through the featherboard. Uh, the featherboard's just to keep the wood from chattering back at you, right? Correct. It prevents kickback and it holds it tight to the fence. Yeah. Right. Right. And the pause, the reason they're at a 45 is so the wood can't move backwards against it. As you're pushing it through, they're getting bent out of the way. But if it ever tries to come back because of kickback, uh, this helps prevent that as well. Cool tool. Um, so mag switches on off magnets. Um, and that's where I was thinking it would be interesting if we had an electronically controlled magnetic railgun where we could turn the magnets on and off in very precise uh, iterations we could do like the mag trains and float really heavy material very, very quickly as we turn the magnets on and off. Yeah. I mean, you got to go look at maglev trains, Matt. You'd think that's yeah. cool. Yeah. Thumbs up. Steve and I, that, that was my segment. Who needs an ice Zamboni when you can have a magnetic ice Zamboni? <laughs> right? Oh, no kidding. <laughs> right? I want a Zamboni oh. that just hovers on its own bed of flames. <laughs> That's not nice. how it works. Led, do you want to go next? Do you want me to go next? Sure, I'll, I'll go next. We'll let you. We'll let you. Uh, okay. Hang on, I gotta. Can I? What part of my screen can I share? I'll share this one right here. So can everybody see my my uh, buddy Steve Wrestler here? It looks like puppeteering. No, no, not at all. So um, my my buddy Steve Wrestler, I used to teach with at West Point. I love his projects. If you ever get a chance to look at any of his stuff. Um, he's done a number of these courses called the Great Courses. Um, I think when you see the uh, the Reims Cathedral in the upper left hand corner there, um, he builds these really complex, um, not, actually not that complex, really instructive models. Um, basically, everything that he's doing on screen, the engineering principles that he's trying to describe in his Great Courses, he often backs them up with um, sophisticated models that he's built with three D printing or out of wood. Um, and he does a lot of really cool modeling um, to, to support it. So, you know, here you can see like an aqueduct that he built, right? So he's got a siphon and an aqueduct, two different ways of moving water across a, across a gap. Um, he's showing a flat arch, Archimedes screw, octagonal domes. You know, as a, as a civil engineer, I really am into this kind of stuff. Um, and And frankly, engineers from before say 1800 were just sort of generalists, right? They were expected to know all kinds of different things. And the uh, the line between who was an engineer and who was an architect was was very small, right? That these were the same kinds of people. But his, anyway, I, I recommend his website, stephenjwrestler.com. Um, he shows a lot of these models. Um, can, can we put those in the show notes, Stephen? If we're doing show notes, can we put in the link for the- No, oh, yeah, it's in there. No, it's it's there. Pretty... And you can see he did a, he did a really cool thing um, called the do-it-yourself engineering resource page. Now, this is meant to be a supplement to his DIY um, uh, great course. So he does a 24 lecture video set on. So I'm not. It's not. I don't mean it to be too much of a pitch, but I guess it kind of is um, that he does these great courses. And in the in the do-it-yourself one, he's got the golf ball launcher, cardboard tower, uh, uh, you know, a beam bridge, suspension. How, how, bridge, how far can we throw the golf ball? Concrete sailboat. Um, that would depend on your DIY ambitions, Matthew. You know, how big a spring, how big a thing you want to build. Um, uh, Steve and I, Steve and I, many years ago, um, uh, with some, <laughs> excuse me, with some students, uh, built a uh, built a ballista um, that threw a golf ball, uh, you know, considerably more than a hundred yards. Um, so that was that was pretty cool. You know, um, and and Steve and I also went many years ago. I think there's a piece of it here. Uh, on the battering ram, uh, right? So oh, we went yeah. to we went to Morocco and built a giant battering ram with the uh, with the Discovery Channel and knocked down a wall outside of Marrakesh, which was pretty cool. Um, one of the strangest things to happen, actually, in my life. Um, but it was it was a neat three weeks uh, spent out there and uh, spent out there in Morocco building stuff. Um, and you know, <laughs> here you can see he's got different photos from the from the from the show and stuff like that. It's pretty pretty fun times. Could, could we go about. back? It sounds like it was something you, you know a little something about. Could you talk to us a little bit about Archimedes' screw? 
Yeah, sure. The Archimedes screw, um, let's see if I'll go back to his DIY engineering resources. So here you see the Archimedean screw, which was uh, one of the earliest types of pumps. And this type of pump uh, remains a very popular, let's see, where is I think it? We have to go, I think we have to go back one more page. Great courses. Great courses. I thought I, I thought it was in one of these DIY. No, nope. no, nope. no. Nope. One more. Nope. I have to go back one great more. Great courses. Great courses. It's in great courses. Listen uh, to Steven. <laughs> oh, there here. we go. Scroll down a little bit. Thanks, guys. Thanks, guys. Help, thanks yeah. for helping me surf the internet, which I'm bad at. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> so the idea of an Archimedean screw is that it lifts water, right? In this case, it's a it's a conical it's a conical screw. Um, these are still used actually quite a bit for moving things that are have a high solids content. So if you went into a sewage mm -hmm. treatment plant, mm -hmm. for instance, you might see one of these things. Or if you're trying to pump something that's got like leaves and acorns and stuff in it, you might use this kind of pump. Um, Doritos. And, you know, yeah. food processing. If you wanted to pump, if you wanted to pump um, a lot of food processing uses this kind of screw. Um, yeah. So for pumping batter, you know, if you're doing like 50,000 pounds of Twinkies a day, you might use one of these to move, you know, whatever. I won't call it cake batter because Twinkie isn't really a cake. It's it's more a manufactured product of some kind. I don't know. I don't know. No disrespect to Twinkies. I mean, I'll eat them. There's no question. It's a cheese food, right? Um, right. Or <laughs> we, cheese, we, right. We, you can pump cheese food with this. We, we uh, are we are courting a Hostess as a sponsor. So. Oh, okay. Well, Hostess, yeah, you could make a lot of Twinkies with this son of a gun. Um, and, you know, you've got, um, you know, if any... If and air gas. Conan, air gas. You can get you see the Conan nitrogen. Movies, if you've seen the Conan movies, right there, where Conan's like turning that giant wheel, he's probably it's probably a screw like this because these were used to irrigate fields for a long, long time. Because you could just put the mm. you put the downstream end into whatever canal or river or pond or whatever you got, and then you're lifting the water. Um, and obviously, the steeper it is, the slower the full flow rate and the more horsepower it takes. Um, but this is a really um, it's a really ancient type of of pump. You know, credit to Archimedes, an ancient Greek mathematician, famous person. Um, but you know, who knows? Who knows what the actual origins of it are? Um, but it's been around for a very, very long time, and it's a cool, cool kind of pump. And anyway, and, and I, I, I just like Steve's website a lot because it, he talks about all that kind of stuff. What different types of water wheels? Um, this is this this one is a is a is a is a pump that's lifting water from below to above. With each one of these hampers holding water, and right, it takes in the water at the at the low spot and drops it out of these holes right here, as they come up above the, as they come up above the, um, this upper trough. So lifting water has been one of the great efforts of man since the beginning of time, right? Because the water is in a low spot, and you want to put it like on your field or in your house or whatever. So. Yeah. Flush the crapper, whatever. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. In, Civil indoor Civil plumbing. Engineers are all about controlling water, keeping it out of the stuff we want to have dry and putting it onto the stuff that we want to be wet. Right. So yeah. we're like 90, 97% water ourselves, by the way. Yeah, that's so. exactly right. That's exactly right. So <laughs> no, now I have but, to figure but, out how to stop sharing. But could you, no, could you, scroll, could you I wanted you to scroll down just a little bit. I was interested in the vaulting thing. Oh, I'm scrolling down now. The groin vaulting. I was like, yeah, I wanted, to, I wanted vault. to know what that was all about. <laughs> no, let's not talk about that right now. <laughs> That's okay. like, you go to prison, you're going to need a groin vault. <laughs> <laughs> That's spectacular. I don't know what you guys are talking about. <laughs> Where? What happened? What happened? Oh, so should we move on to my my topic then? Yeah, that sounds great. So, um, I don't know. So it's a little bit personal, but um, my uh, family. Uh, Christine's family, my wife, um, her sister-in-law got um, recently diagnosed with leukemia, right? And so she's fighting the leukemia battle, and we wish her the best in that. Wow. Best, right? All, all this, the best to her in her yeah. struggle. Yeah. But, you know, I really wanted to, to celebrate some of the stuff that she's done. And she's an amazing uh, ceramics artist, right? Um, you know, this is her in her studio, and, you know throwing pots, so to speak, right? And, um, you know, we, know, we probably all know some people that do, do some pottery in one way or the other. She's, um, you know, very renowned artist in this aspect. She does a lot of abstract stuff lately. Um, and, you know, so this is some of her work. And uh, this, cool. some of her earlier work is uh, really ornamental, uh, super detailed, super defined with straight lines and geometric patterns and stuff. That's and I really like. I love, I love the one with the waves up above. Uh, this one here. 
No, one up from that, one row up on the end. This, this, of uh, all the way to your right. This, that one, that is yeah, something. yeah. But so what? A uh, little bit. I've been thinking about it, and it's like, you know, pottery is almost next level creation stuff, right? When we talk about magnets or uh, Steve Ressler's stuff, it's it's very core engineering, right? Like uh, joinery or, you know, I'm going to use this tool to do that, or I'm going to go along this straight line. But to me, uh, ceramics and, and, and pottery, uh, the I don't want to trivialize it. The basics are simple, right? But then- it's very elemental. These, Let's call it elemental, man. Elemental. Thank you. Elemental. Um, but, yeah. you know, you, you build on, you like scaffolding for teachers, right? You scaffold to a point where you're doing some really high-end creation stuff. And I thought that was, you know, there's certain uh, beauty and art in that aspect of it is what, you know, I was thinking. The the trial and error and then repeat, like honing in on the glazing, like just the aspect of glazing and how the color looks radically different when it's the liquid glaze sitting in the five gallon bucket. You glaze it and it looks like this gray or it looks like, a, you know, some brown hue. And then you glaze it and it comes out this brilliant yellow or it comes out this very vivid blue. Um, the glazing process to me is uh, very mysterious, but it's very repeatable. Like once you get down, I put in this much goo and I put in this much stuff, I get a very consistent color coming out of it. Uh, to me, I'm always intrigued by ceramics and the process of firing and the changes that we put the materials through. Yeah. Well, so an interesting uh, fact is that um, high-end artists in, in, in pottery, they don't keep a lot of their mistakes, right? They destroy them intentionally, right? Mm -hmm. And so for me- Glass artists and, too. And for, um, I'm gonna get this wrong, but just as an example, for every one piece that Grace created, there are 20 or 100 pieces that were destroyed, yeah. right? And her husband, which uh, my uh, brother-in-law, Brad, He's awesome. He's more of a computer scientist, uh, psychologist type person, right? And uh, he's like, "How can you destroy all that? We could sell that, <laughs> right? right?" But um, part it's of the, right. the, the it's not right. Part of the right, exactly, exactly. So it's part of the beauty of of being a, a ceramic artist, right? So, so. I want to. So, Stephen, you, you touched on it, and then Led mentioned it too. So let's pull back and ask one of those meta questions. A couple of episodes ago, Led talked a lot about design and so. Um, Quality mm -hmm. control, like how do you know when something is good enough that it can leave your shop with your, like that was good enough for my shop, but this one wasn't. What do I put on the burn pile as a woodworker? Um, uh, in many arts, I'm very likely to try to point out all of my errors when I get to a piece, right? Like I'm like, oh, mm -hmm. here's where I messed up this part or here's where this joint didn't go to. Can't you see this one sixteenth inch gap over here that like I'm really frustrated by? And they're like, I never would have seen that. Um, so you're saying there's a high failure rate in the ceramics that Grace does? Well, I'm, I don't know today, but I would say that early days when, when we were talking about it, yeah. So yeah. It's, one, it's one of the tough things about, about framing, you know, like when you're putting up a, a, a house or a, or, a, or a large barn or something like that, is that you're often just going, right? So whatever mistake you made, you got to spackle over it or figure out a solution or like, you're not going to just cut down that column and remove it from the building. You, you can't. Um, and so as projects get more complex, uh, you know, our ability to achieve any kind of perfection, I think probably plummets, right? Cause you, you, and, and Matthew, I did a thousand square feet of hardwood floors in my house by myself, you know, and I shouldn't say by myself, but I mean, we did it as a DIY family project. Um, lots of help from the family and getting that project done. But as I walk around my house, all I see is the mistakes, <laughs> right? That's all I see. Um, and that's, and that's, I think that's the nature of any craftsman. You probably see them too in your projects, don't you? Oh, that's, that's all I ever see. Right. So yeah, Trish is very careful with me that I'm not allowed to talk about the mistakes in my projects. Um, right. When I go to show it to somebody, I'm not allowed to talk about that. Uh, we put in hardwood floor in our house and 
every day I see the three boards that I had to cut a little notch out of to get them to sit into the next line correctly. Like in two spaces, I have like a quarter inch thing. And so I custom cut a piece of wood to cover up the quarter inch mistake. And it's like three spots out of a huge whole floor. And right. That's all I ever see. Right. The only thing I ever, I don't see the beauty of the other 95% that I did perfectly. It's those three boards that required a little customization that I see. Yeah. You know, so this is part of the human condition, by the way. I mean, this is just absolutely uh, to be real meta. Uh, human beings survive on this planet because we manage by exception. We're pro- hardwired in our brain to look for things that are going to eat us, right? <laughs> like things yeah, that are going to destroy us. True. Right. And because of that, we're always looking for the exceptions. We're not looking for the positives in, in what's happening. Well, I, but right? I think it's, I think it's more interesting than that, Stephen, because <laughs> what I've noticed is that I'm allowed to talk about my own failures, but if I went into a public setting and talked about how great my work was, like that would be right. so cringeworthy. Like if I went into a public space, well, where I was displaying my own art and I talked about why the art or the reasons for it or how I thought about it, that's fine. But if I said, man, that is some great workmanship that I did. Look at the corners I got on that, man. That is awesome. Like that's a, an artist is always allowed to talk about their mistakes, failures, problems, but, and you're allowed well, to talk about the ideas, but talking about the craftsmanship, like that's really rare that an artist is like, yeah, my brush strokes are great. Way better than anybody else. <laughs> like you just won't hear well, that. I, I think, you know, the, everybody has their own approach to it. I mean, I hate to bring him up as an example because I'm not a big fan, but, you know, Mr. Trump, everything he does is awesome, right? It's the greatest ever. Yeah. And maybe that's a load of bullshit. (laughs) Yeah. I think for a lot of people, that's that's really cringy, isn't it? Don't you think that's that's a cringy thing about him? Yeah. But let's look at the antithesis. Let's look at um, Banksy, for example, right? I mean, the the idea of being sort of that uh, anonymous street artist, Right, it's almost the opposite. I loved right? it when the guy bought the piece of art, and then like the, bit the gavel came down, it shredded it. Yeah, exactly. I loved that. <laughs> Thought that was great. Oh wait, yeah, you're so, still laughing. Stephen's still laughing. It's like years ago, and he's yep. still laughing because it's hilarious. Okay, so I just sent you a link in the chat, and let uh, uh, Stephen, can I share my screen for a second? Would that be acceptable? I could, we got to show this video, though, right? Yeah, you got to know. Okay, here we go. <laughs> Complete with sound effect. <laughs> what just happened? What? Um. So one of my favorite. Least... Oh, go ahead. Do you get the shredded pieces at the end? Right. Do I get the frame with the shredder? <laughs> oh well. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing. I so love that one. That. And everyone's like, <laughs> "What is happening?" Um, oh, one, of, one of the guys that I follow on the internet is uh, the oatmeal and the oatmeal is absolutely fabulous. I find him to be uh, super interesting. And so here is uh, his take on why it's hard to receive a compliment. And I'm just going to show you the first two frames. You can read the rest later, mm-hmm. put it in the show notes. But here's a situation you may find yourself in where somebody tells you that you're great. Right. And this is your brain's reaction to that. Yeah. The old <laughs> imposter syndrome. Correct. And I, right. It's just absolutely fabulous. The whole cartoon is wonderful. Um, we'll tell a story. Trish and I collect cookie jars, right? So that's a thing in our house. There's lots of cookie jars. We went to an auction where the artist had made a mold and they do slip molds and stuff for the cookie jars. So he had made a mold. Uh, and no, he had made a, I know what you're going to tell me. Uh. And, he ma- and he made the prototype. So he had the prototype jar. This is what the jar could look like if you use this mold. And here's the mold. And Trish and I are bidding on cookie jars at the auction and they're, you know, one or two or $300 or here's a $30 jar. Here's a $50 jar or whatever. Uh, and then as one of the very last items of the day, they auction off this custom mold and the one of a kind prototype. And um, the bidding uh, was interesting. It went 1,000, 2,000, 4,000, 6,000. Um, it ended up selling for $7,800. And the guy, wa- the guy who bought it had bought a special box. He knew he was going to buy the whole thing. Um, and he goes up. He takes the cookie jar. He takes it back to his wife, hands her. She puts it in the special box. And then he goes back up and takes the mold. 
and smashes it on the floor, right? And now he's got a guaranteed, one-of-a-kind, never-going-to-be-duplicated jar by this very famous artist, uh, Don Winton. Um, and it was uh, an amazing. So uh, you're talking about shredding the art. Like, I just bought this mold for X number of dollars, and I smashed it so I could have just the prototype. Because I want to be the only one that has this one. <laughs> That's that. That is correct. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Mine, oh mine! No one else can get it. <laughs> one million dollars, something like that. Nice. Anyway, yes. Anyway, but okay, the Banksy shredding, hilarious. Yes, yes. The the uh, the the guy smashing the mold. I I don't know because he didn't make the mold, he but he just, bought it. He just owned it. Yeah. Right. And as the owner, is he a caretaker? Right, like no, no, or like if I bought like, could I just go and buy a Rembrandt tomorrow and set it on fire for my own fun? Sure, yes, that would Mr. Make Beast horrible, does that. That would make right? me a horrible person. <laughs> but but isn't that the whole point of personal property? Right, like if you're going to build the whole system on personal I hate property, that idea. I I hate that idea. That makes me crazy to think that someone well, that's a priceless a priceless um. You know, like a, like a like a Picasso, but, but it's it, not priceless. You you spent your money, right? You had oh, to spend X part million. Of our human heritage. I, so is my poo. I I just put it down the drain. Yes, but no one cares about that part of our human heritage. So who decides? Yeah, well, who cares? Yeah, no, we tend to, we tend to, you do. So, <laughs> yeah. so so Len, who who decides what goes? Why are we the... talking about scatological things in our podcast? <laughs> why is it that wait, who's going to decide what goes in the pantheon? me well no that's not how it works yeah that's how it works for me no mm. no that's, that's no, not I'm, just, how... I'm just saying that that like if you own a piece of land you can't just like set it on fire sure you can yeah that's terrible that's... well so this is interesting led so i think that um our kids generation and i'm gonna say our kids generation is just generic um they're getting used to that because in order to get attention on YouTube and be a content creator, you have to do these outlandish things, right? So one of the top uh, content creators, Mr. Beast, he will regularly destroy highly valuable things to get more, more views, more clicks, more everything. So, I mean, his classic one, he destroys, he has one of his big metal shredders and he shreds a Lamborghini. Right, but that's and, so many sweat and toil and blood went into making that thing. It's why I hate. And we're all going to watch the train wreck. I, I hate we're arsonists. Watch, we're you know, gonna, it, so, but somebody, we're gonna watch. I hate it. I hate NASCAR when cars crash and somebody gets hurt. But I'm gonna watch it. <laughs> it's like okay, there's these famous videos. Formula One. I mean, those are millions and millions of dollars. For There's these cars, famous videos crash. of like drift kings, like <laughs> smashing their cars. You know, they have these like super expensive cars and they smash into a telephone pole or something. And all I can think about is the guy that made that car. That's all I can think about. And he made it as good as he could and as perfect as he could and probably got paid not very much for doing it. Okay, um, and so then some rich idiot goes and like piles it into a pole. So like, we need, uh, we I don't know. We need to back the conversation up before the podcast started. Stephen and I were talking about workbenches and how they get beat up a little bit and ways that we protect our precious workbenches. Um, oh, no. No, no. So if Don't I build a workbench, a workbench work is meant to be abused and destroyed. Well, what's a car meant to be done with? Used in a loving manner. No, admired. 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 No. Left no. in the garage like a garage like baby. A... No, then your Ferris Bueller's A trailer friend... queen. <laughs> no, your, your Ferris Bueller's friend's dad at this point. Just, you got the Ferrari in the glassed-in garage. <laughs> right? And Ferris is the one cleaning the Ferris Ferrari. Bueller's friend's dad. The, the guys at the parking garage. I'm not Ferris ones... Bueller's dad. Okay. <laughs> I'm just... The guys at the parking garage were the ones who treated the Ferrari correctly. They went out and had fun with it. <laughs> it wasn't right. a Ferrari. <laughs> yeah, it was. It was. Was it, it a was. Ferrari? Yeah. It was a Ferrari Daytona something yeah. something. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't and, know. And, right, and so the guys at the parking garage take it out and drive it around all day while Ferris is off goofing off in Chicago. Right? And they uh, bring it home. And like Ferris is Yeah, Ferris Bueller. The movie, the movie wasn't about Ferris Bueller at all. It was about Cameron and Ferris Bueller's sister. 
that's who the, the movie was actually about. Ferris Bueller was just a force of nature, a deus machina. Um, he he just like I well, so know. so there is a question: Was hmm. Ferris Bueller even the real person, right? Or was it just Cameron's alter ego that enabled him to do all of the things, right? There's a there's a fan theory that Ferris Bueller didn't even exist. Well, now we're getting into the territory of how many years did the guy actually spend? How many years did the guy actually spend in um in uh Groundhog Day? How many years was he actually up there? Yes. 1961 Ferrari 250 GT California Spider, says our producer. Yeah, very good. Nice. Yes. I uh, love our intrepid you. producer. <laughs> our, our producer is the best. Yeah, she is the bomb. No question about it. No question so, about somebody it. will have her on camera. How stupid we are. And so has to like <laughs> insert like, hey, you guys are just being hey. like, it has descended into complete idiocy. So let me insert some actual facts. Our producer today is. Let me Google that for you. <laughs> <laughs> let me Google for that that for you, you idiots. <laughs> that is one of my favorite websites. I love the Let Me Google That For You website that builds a little video showing you typing in the thing they asked you about. Okay, so I have to tell you my 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 latest my latest <laughs> weird thing that I'm doing, and then you guys can judge me. Okay, so this is going to be latest weird thing judged by the writers. <clears throat> So I'm beginning because email has become so useless. Like email is a completely broken communication method. It's terrible. No one likes it. You know, somebody sends you an email and you just cry. So I, it's I wish for old I, people. Yeah, it's I wish email people. would like fall in a river and drown. Um, so um, what I've started doing is trying to make a piece of AI art, what? like the one you see behind me, that illustrates my point that I'm trying to make in the email. Um, like I, I recently was decommissioning a building, like a whole building and it was full of furniture, but I actually had something I was going to do with all the furniture, not just like throw it in a dumpster. Right. But of course, all the furniture pirates show up from all over the organization and begin like hauling off the furniture, like loot. Um, and so I did this, I did this piece of art and I said, no furniture pirates, you know, and I did a piece of AI art that depicted furniture pirates. Um, but literally none of my colleagues know what to think about it and they don't comment on it they just they think i've maybe I, I so either they think it's cool and they don't want me to stop or they think i've lost my mind or they don't get it or i i don't know but like i'm actually enjoying writing email when i'm able to drop a piece of ai art in the email that that sort of tells the story i'm trying to tell but led you're in such an institutionalized organization that when you start working outside the box you you're gonna get the Easter Island guys. They're gonna pop up. <laughs> they're gonna look around the the coffee ta conference table, and they're not they're not gonna say anything because, like, you just came from another planet with that artwork. <laughs> yeah, it's not in the it's not in the book of how to write memos. <laughs> yeah, the, the, well, there is some of that, but I will say that my colleagues are by and large very creative people. Um, yeah. You know, um, now there are a lot of rules where I where I work. Like we have more rules than pretty much anybody, um, and you know that's important to how we're structured and how we teach and all that kind of stuff. But anyway, so I'm just wondering, you know, like 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 uh, forget the background and like my own personal story of whether it's working or not. Like, is this just dumb, or would you like to get an email that had a? Well, so I, I don't let, know. So, so let it. So, so, I, as I said, judge away, judge away. So I want to ask the question: At some point, are you just the eccentric old guy that we kind of have around in the Fair. institute, it, right? Who's just like they're kind of out of touch. They don't really understand how to Snapchat, right? They've never Venmoed anybody any money, uh, and they sit in their office and they make this really weird AI generated art that they're attaching to their emails, and everybody's <laughs> like, "Hmm, that guy He's lost it. That guy He's on the second, lost it. That guy on." the second floor like why are we keeping him around yeah right like uh like iago they're like iago in the in the scene from aladdin that's it he's lost it <laughs> it's over exactly <laughs> well we have a um we have uh Wait, that a would make me the like... that would make me jafar forget that that's not yeah. how it is i'm not jafar nah. we have a, a senior guy in our organization who I'm not a big fan. Okay. How do I, I put that? Um, and he's probably going to watch my podcast now. Who knows? Hey there. <laughs> right. And well, they're all um, guessing if it's them. Now it's like all the right. people in the organization, like, is it me? <laughs> oh, they'll know. Cause um, when he first got his senior position, every Friday he would send out a Dilbert, right. With some sort of um, totally 
not really relating to business topic that uh -huh. that's you know on his message and i think someone finally told him that that was just you know stop it <laughs> <laughs> i don't think you're in that category led but i mean you risk a yeah. couple steps away from that yeah, I, I, you, you I can just see get any feedback right like i'm just trying to get but it, it's also partly because email has become so tedious and annoying and boring that i just don't even want to engage it so google, google you know? tried uh what 10 years ago 15 years ago to do google wave right and like change the way that we communicate and uh, it went over like a lead something, a lead balloon. Yeah, yeah. So, so lead. I would say that you can see the Dilbert cartoon territory from where you're standing, as you're at least like trying to be cool and hip and use AI. <laughs> but you can see the Dilbert territory close to where you're standing, and um, just in terms of navigation, I'll help you see that terrain in front of you. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I gotcha. I gotcha. Yeah. So, well, uh, how far am ben I? Ben talks about. Ben talks about. Um, how certain people in his office have been talking about setting up like dueling chat bots on email. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Like, right. That's what I want to do. <laughs> oh, so we've talked in, in academia. They're doing it. What we've talked about <laughs> is I can use AI to generate my exam and then Led can use his AI to generate the answers to my exam. Right. And so do we really just have dueling bots at some point of the content for the class? Well, well even and, better, and, even better is um, professors often get the same questions from students during the course of the semester. Oh, no. Over the AI. course of our career, Stephen. Over the course of our <laughs> right. career. The career, course of your career. You could just have AI write the response. No, I do not take, you know, excuses because you were, you know, yeah. blah, blah, yeah. blah, 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 blah. Okay. And, so, uh, so one of my friends uh, is actually writing something to that effect for his classes. I want to train. I want to train an AI using only my old emails, of which there are a lot, and then it would write just like me, and it could write responses to all the emails that come to me using if I only trained it with my previous responses. That's, um, that's a that's a good idea. So that's there's easy actually, to do. So there's actually yeah, a easy tool. to do. Yes, it is. There, there's a tool, and I forget the name of it. I apologize. I wasn't prepped for this for this uh, segment. There's a tool. Is used, this a segment? Is that what we're doing? That on. Uh, doing evaluations and writing back feedback to your students. And usually there's like 10 or 15 things that I want to say to students. And it's this tool that cues them up in a clipboard. And then as you're grading the thing, you say, I want to write comment seven here. And you push the comment seven button and it dumps in your keyboard, your clipboard number seven yep. of, of the thing. And it's very common in the learning management systems to use this plugin to make that happen. Yeah, I think Canvas does that. Yeah. And so it's this really interesting, like semi automated. It takes me 10 seconds to write the two sentence paragraph that I was going to write that I repeat on a regular basis. But I have enough of them in the queue that it's not just everybody getting the same feedback. It sounds dynamic. It sounds individual, uh, but it really accelerates my process. Do you know what AI is going to make us do, Matthew, as teachers? Right. To add value, the only way to do it is going to be to actually meet with our students and speak with them which no. is something we have been avoiding doing for like 40 years uh, so like I'm to, inviting sit a, with, to sit down with each student and find out what they actually know. I'm inviting a guest to our, our, uh, our podcast here. Hang on. Hey, hey Ben. Saying, Can you hear me? Uh, Ben's muted right now, but I think he's going to join us. Yeah. Hey, what's up? Hey, are you on video? Oh, there he, he is. is. We got a hey. ceiling fan and everything. Wow, an actual young person. Yeah, way to spice be. Up the, way to spice up the podcast, Stephen. Right. So I had a question for you, uh, Ben. We were chatting about professors, right, who are teaching classes, and um, could you write an AI engine to respond to incoming emails based on your historic uh, sent emails? As a professor. Yeah. Well, just as a person, as a person, I'm an accountant oh, yeah. in an accounting firm, you know, how difficult would it be to write something like that or to train I the think, engine to do it? I think the question isn't whether or not you could do it. I think the question, like you've easily could, like I could easily use the chat GPT API and say, send an email every time I get a response where the email that I received is the prompt. Uh, the difficulty is how much does it sound like me, right? Like how much, how often is it responding with but what I wanted to But couldn't you do say? like, couldn't you do um, retrieval augmented gen generative AI to actually go yeah, back and look at your old emails? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. It's like you would train the AI to... bot 
using all my old emails that I had written. So you can sound so like it would Lex. sound like you. Exactly. If so, you've written so, enough emails. Yeah, so, I, let, let's say that let's say that over the course of my career I've written ten thousand emails. Would that oh, be yeah. enough that an AI could like sound like me? I do that at work already. Yeah, you, <laughs> you easily could do that. <laughs> Are you admitting things you shouldn't, Ben? I mean, honestly. I, I just resigned. I'm I'm free to <laughs> I can talk about whatever I want right now. The AI, the AI that's built on the me that used to exist makes all the money and I just sit at home. Easy. <laughs> Easy day. <laughs> Easy day. Yeah. Uh yeah, Ben, I hear you're gonna be traveling to Chicago here shortly. Uh two weeks. I'm gonna spend uh actually I'm gonna spend a couple of weeks in the Adirondacks. My friends and I are going to try to hit as many of the high peaks as we can. Nice. Uh, and then, yeah, end of the month, we're heading to, I'm heading to U Chicago. So on the 9th, 10th, 11th, something like that, uh, Aunt Trish and I will be driving through Chicago. Uh, Excellent. It, it might, I might text you and see if we can connect. Very cool. Yeah. Excellent. Very Excellent. interested. Excellent. So we were argue, we were suggesting that maybe there could be some bot battles where I would use a bot to write an exam and then you could use a bot to write answers and then I could use a bot to grade your answers. Is that not what's already happening? Right. That's what we're saying. I <laughs> am a bot. You're looking at a bot. It's just a yeah. very uh, it just it the problem with this bot is it actually demands dinner and like bourbon and so, stuff, so, you know, so, to grade. So <laughs> your uncle Ledley is suggesting that uh, the only way around this is to actually physically meet with students in his office and talk to them about what they know. That, that's where AI AI is the disaster for professors because it's going to make us actually talk to our students in person in order to understand what they know. So right. it, it, it's a uh, what a train wreck that is. So what, so, would you, yeah. what would you, as a student, what would you think of that, Ben, of having to go into your professor's office and defend what you know? Yeah, everything becomes a dissertation defense, right? I mean, fundamentally, if like being a student is an apprenticeship for eventually doing research, then everything at some point circles back to the oral exam. Uh, yeah, I, I think I think suddenly the the there is going to be a divergence in the two modes of education. I think we'll see IVs suddenly transition to like this more apprenticeship based thing where it's one on one with a mentor who's meeting me as a human. And then you have the rubber stamp that I was able to pass through, you know, uh, yeah. uh, well, flagship you. Project well, project based learning has been sending us that direction for a long time where so we one, pose so, questions and explore the questions together, um, you know, on a journey of, on a journey of discovery. Like I, to, to I, me, I have to speak up. It's expensive. That's expensive to do. Takes a lot of, takes a lot of manpower. Let, let I, I'm going to put some, uh, you said I wasn't allowed to, I'm not allowed to talk about poop anymore, but I'm going to put some poop on Thank your you. idea. Wait, you uh, just talked about it again. <laughs> so here's my problem. Here's my problem with it. Um, the oral exam introduces a great deal of bias -y, right? There's cultural bias and the subjective bias that works its way in. One of the reasons we like the standardized Fair. test is that it drives out my personal bias and just were you able to work to the right answer? Well, assuming you can write an unbiased test, which you cannot. So, but you get this hidden curriculum or this hidden criteria that I like Ben because he talks fast and he's got my same mode of operation. And I validate that he thinks quickly, he says things quickly, he's articulate. And like, hey, that's Horns my and halos, right? Right. Yeah. 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 And so he's like me, and I know that I'm awesome. So Ben must be okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's fair. Yeah. That's fair. Um, and so the oral exam so, is not so, the panacea. Uh, maybe, uh, the other option is we give up. Right. So we can also just give up. Right. Like, no, I, I no, guess, no, I just, no, 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 I just think, Matthew, that using um, so a lot of professors are trying to ban AI use as a no. me method of teaching no. their students, which is a terrible idea because that's like banning a calculator in 1978, which that's people correct. did. People did ban calculators yeah. in 1978. Yeah, we still do. Uh, yeah. And we some still do. Yeah. Um, but that's not the solution, of course. Um, no, it, need, it's only no. a matter of time before AutoCAD is linked directly to an AI engine and you just tell it to draw the part. Um, instead of having to be this spectacular operator who's like a concert pianist on AutoCAD, right? That, that right. I mean, you look at like what uh, Conrad Wolfram was doing with the uh, you know math education in Estonia, for example, right? I was just listening to something about that. And he's he's like, why are we teaching people how to compute numbers, right? Like 10 plus 10, right? We can put that in a machine that's going to give us the answer today. We can skip that part of the curriculum and save oh, a year. Yeah, we can move from <laughs> we can move from turning the crank to actual analysis and um, and creativity. Framing right? the problem. I, I want to bring Ben and translating to mathematics. 
I yeah. want to bring Ben back into the conversation a little bit. Ben, how do you feel about becoming a prompt engineer? Ooh, uh, what's the purpose of education? Is it signaling or is it skill acquisition? Right. right. Ooh, yes. Ooh, and so ooh. this is the whole, I love that you call this signaling. This is the, this wait, is the wait, who brought scientist. the humanities into this? Like, <laughs> as engineers, yes. like that was something you got a humanities oh. question. Come on. Oh, okay. ben. So led back in the 1960s, what percentage of the U S population attempted any education after high school? 1960. Uh, I'll, I'll go five to 8%. You're pretty close. Actually. What do you think the number huh. is today? Probably 40 to 60 percent. Yeah, you're very close. It's high 40s is the right answer. And to me, huh. what's really interesting, Ben mentioned signaling in the 1960s and 70s. When I got my degree in higher education, I walked out with my bachelor's degree. I was signaling that I was in the top 10 percent of what was going on. Like I had a lot of potential today. I'm signaling when I get my bachelor's degree. Hey, I'm in the top 40 percent. And that's not the same signal. And it doesn't come with the same economic consequences. Well, I mean, that's why the signals are cut into pieces now, right? That signal is cut into Ivy League pieces and and big state university pieces yes. and master's yes. degree, PhD. Yes, blah, so there's blah, a lot blah. of little pieces there, Matthew. <clears throat> yes. So yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, so, I, I think I think our podcast is probably over time this evening, though it's been extremely. I know, interesting. right? Let's ben, we Ben, we very much appreciate you joining our podcast. This was spectacular. Anytime. Thank yeah, you for I, joining our media. As, I'm going to take it as personal validation, even though it isn't personal validation. I'm going to take it as personal validation that Ben is still willing to speak to us, even though we're older. Of like, so. ben, <laughs> That's awesome. ben, could you hold up your arm one more time? I'm very intrigued. Oh, uh, my snake? Yeah. The little, yeah. yeah, I have a snake with the, the floral print inside of it. That's I also, we were, we were talking about humanities. I have Sisyphus pushing his boulder on my arm. This is spectacular. Oh, is that about working out? Is that what that's supposed to be? Yes. About? Yeah. That, that's for working out. Not, not, yeah, right. Drive. You put it on there because it's like your biceps. You want to keep your biceps going, man. You got to, it's exactly. like Sisyphus. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. yeah. We have to, we have to imas- imagine that Sisyphus is absolutely shredded. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> he would be, right? He would yeah. be. That's all he's doing all day. Yeah, man. He's just absolutely yeah. cut. All, all right. right. I'm supposed to make a big loud noise. Oh, yeah. That's a uh, clapper. Clap yeah, on. goodbye. Oh, <laughs> my